So we're going to look today at inverse trig functions. Remember we could call it the inverse sine or the arc sine, the inverse cosine or the arc cosine. Uh, we worked with these last year. And how do we know if a function has an inverse? If we're looking at the graph, how do you know if a function has an inverse? And what does that mean? Do what? Horizontal line test. What, what about the horizontal line test? They can't, two points can't be on the same line. line. Like two points can't be on the same horizontal line. All right. Another way with calculus, we said it has to be strictly monotonic. monotonic. All right. What about our trick functions? Are they strictly monotonic? No. 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 Some of them are. Are they? Make the tangent. Is it? Yeah. Okay. If we were to graph the tangent function, it looks no. like this. Oh, darn. Okay. It is strictly monotonic, but yeah, with the it, 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 but there's it's not continuous. Oh. Okay, so it also has to be continuous and strictly monotonic if it's got an inverse function. So let's first look at the sine function. This is going to be a quick review. Okay, so the sine looks like this. Obviously, it does not have an inverse function as is. But we learned last year we could make some restrictions so that we would have an inverse function. We could restrict our domain. Do you remember where we restricted our domain for the sine function? Negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Good. Negative pi over 2. We cut it off here and here so that this is what we're looking at. So we said that if we restrict our domain to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, What's our range? Negative one to one. And so for the inverse function, for y equals the arc sine, of x, the domain is negative one to one. And the range is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now, last year we didn't talk about the inverse of the sine, but if we were going to have an inverse cosecant or arc cosecant, we would keep the same restrictions. Because if we were going to graph the cosecant, remember, it would just look like this. That's all we would see of the cosecant, or the arc, uh, and that's not the graph of the arc cosecant. But that's all we would, if we, with that same restriction as the sine. Now let's look at the restriction for the cosine. Okay, so if we graph that real quickly, it looks like this. Where did we restrict the cosine? Can we zero. use negative pi over 2 to pi over 2? Zero to pi. Zero to pi. And then we're looking just from here to here. So if the domain here is zero to pi, the range is still what? Yeah. For the inverse cosine, our domain is negative 1 to 1, and the range is 0 to pi. In fact, that's what the answers your calculator gives you. If you use the inverse function on your calculator, you're only going to get an answer, even though within uh, unit circle or within all four quadrants, there are two places where the cosine is positive. You're only going to get the first quadrant value on your calculator. You would have to figure out the second quadrant value. 
There's only, there's two places where the cosine's negative from 0 to 2 pi, but your calculator's only going to give you the second quadrant value for the cosine. Yes, ma'am. Can you get the range from looking on the y-axis? Yes. Yes. And so for the arc secant, you're going to have the same restrictions in, or, in order for us to get an inverse function for the secant. We'd have to have the same restrictions as the cosine. So let's look at tangent and cotangent. Okay, here. And then it would repeat the process so on and so on and so on. So where do our restrictions need to be for the tangent to get an inverse function? Negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now notice here we cannot include negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Why not? Those are vertical asymptotes. And so what does that mean? Undefined values. Yes. <laughs> What's the range? Negative infinity to positive infinity. Negative infinity to positive infinity. So for the arctan, the domain. Negative infinity. Yeah, they just switch places. And the range is only going to be between negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So if you had a second quadrant angle and you plugged it into your calculator, it's going to give you a negative angle. So you'd have to manipulate that value to get the second quadrant angle. Um, and then cotangent. We didn't talk about the cotangent last year, but let's see if we can figure out what a restriction would be on the cotangent. Cotangent looks like this. So what kind of restriction would we need to make on our domain? Um, zero to pi. Zero to pi. And the range? So for the arc cotangent, those just switch places. Right, if I have that the arc sign, I want the, I'm given the arc sign of negative one half. That means I want to know the angle whose sign is negative one half. In other words, if it's easier for you to think about it this way, you could rewrite it as the sine of theta equals negative one half. It's not necessary, but that's what you're trying to figure out. What angle has a sign of negative one half? And we're using radian measure, so this is one we should know. What angle has a sign of negative one half? Remember, our answer is going to be between negative pi over two and pi over two because it's going to be between negative pi over two and pi over two because this is an inverse. And we had a remember our the range that we can get was the domain of the restriction, so we can only get an answer between negative pi over two and pi over two. Not three. Six. Negative pi over six. Oh. Yeah, definitely. She did that. And I was like. <laughs> Arc cosine of zero. What angle has a cosine of zero between zero and pi? Pi over two. It's just a matter of getting our thinking. Arc tan, square root of 3. What angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 has a tangent of the square root of 3? 
pi over 3. Do we need to go over the hand again? If we're doing tangent, it's like yes. All right, when we started out with the arctan of 2x minus 3 equals pi over 4, I took the tangent of both sides. And using the idea of composition of functions, this side becomes 2x minus 3. This side becomes 1, and we can solve it for x. So we'll do another one. Arctan of 2x minus 5 equals negative 1. Again, the easiest way to do this is to take the tangent of both sides because the tangent of the arctan in this case is going to be 2x minus 5. So I'm going to take the tangent of both sides. All right. This side becomes 2x minus 5. And this, I'm, we could go ahead, I'm just going to leave it as a tangent of negative 1 right here. Because we don't want to use an approximation in something that we're going to keep using. So I'm going to leave it as an exact, exact value until I get all the way to x equals. So we get 2x equals the tangent of negative, of negative 1 plus 5, and then divide all that by 2. Now plug it in your calculator. Yeah, 1.721. 1. All right, given that y equals the arc sine of x, and y is between 0 It's not going to let me, never mind. Zero is less than y is less than pi over two. I want to find the cosine of y. All right, so on this case, we know some right triangle identities. If <clears throat> I want to find the angle whose sine is x, this is what I'm looking for. First of all, I'm going to draw a triangle that this represents. Okay, so if this, if this is theta and the sine of theta is x, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, can we find the adjacent side? How? Joe? Hmm? The other side. How do we find it? Yes, I know it's the other side, but how do we do it algebraically? Uh, is it opposite over hypotenuse? Well, that's going to be the cosine, but I don't know what... It, I mean, adjacent over hypotenuse is cosine. What's the adjacent side equal to? What's one of those theorems that when you see a right triangle should immediately come to your mind? Did you learned in middle school? The 30, 60, 90 one? No. no. I'm not sure. How about the Pythagorean theorem? <laughs> oh, yeah. That Caitlin's back there whispering desperately to you. <laughs> The Pythagorean theorem says that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c is a hypotenuse. So in this case, what is the adjacent side going to be? Square root of 1 minus x squared, which is not 1 minus x. Hey, hey, I didn't ask you this time. <laughs> we waited a little bit. Yeah. So right. now what's the cosine <laughs> of theta? <laughs> probably uh, well, let's just use our hand dandy. No. Oh. Calculator. Oh, calculator. Sorry. 
Oh, I love my calculator. What's the cosine? Math. Or in this, it asks us the cosine of y. <laughs> Let me change that to a y. Oh. It's to stay consistent. Cosine of y. So that'd be um. Adjacent. So the square root yeah, of one right. minus x squared over, over one. So, so that's it. So on these, you just draw a right triangle. That's wonderful. Sokotoa. Sokotoa. All right, if we know that y equals the arc <laughs> secant, <laughs> square root of 5 over 2, I want to find the tangent of y. So the first step, draw a right triangle. Done. How do we get secant? It's 1 over the cosine, so you just flip the cosines, which is adjacent over hypotenuse, so it's going to be the hypotenuse is square root of 5, and the adjacent is 2. So what is the opposite side? It's going to be square root of 5, so 5 minus 4, take a square root of that, equals the other side, so it's 2. 2? Two? No. No, it's, it's just 1. So what's the tangent of y? Yeah, 1 half. I thought she did too. <laughs> All right. So that's it for today. Magic. Nice. Let me write down the assignment for those that are watching. What did you say? <laughs> I'm going to do it, maybe. Uh, I said maybe, yes. so it's not a lie. How six to twenty. Let's see, three, four, six to twenty-seven every third, and thirty-one and thirty-four.